Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Discovering More About Lent. This is session five. Uh, I'll start by just quickly recapping what we've covered in the previous sessions, and then I'll hand over to Mike Slynn for his talk on the social teaching of the Catholic Church. Then we'll have a breakout group uh, to discuss a couple of questions that Mike will provide for us. And then we'll have a further talk on service in the parish by Mike Elks. Uh, and then we'll gather back in plenary. We'll finish with a short prayer and then we'll finish the meeting at nine o'clock promptly. But anyone who wants to stay on for a chat, then you'll be most welcome. We'll, we'll stay around for a bit longer. So just to remind you, in the first week of Lent, we joined uh, Jesus in the wilderness where he was tempted and he faced three temptations, the same three temptations that we face in our lives. The temptation of the flesh or bodily desires, the temptation of the world and the temptation of the spirit of wanting to put God to the test or to have God on our terms and not his. And he, of course, resisted these temptations as the new Adam, unlike the first Adam who, who fell to those temptations. And we face those temptations in our lives and we face up to them in Lent. And the church provides us with three remedies, fasting for temptations of the body, prayer for temptations of the spirit, and um, almsgiving for temptations of the world. And we looked a little bit at those, uh, those three pillars of Lent, prayer and fasting. And then we spent more time looking at almsgiving or service. So in session uh, three, uh, we looked at our call to service and the fact that this is not an optional extra for Christians, that we are all called to serve others. And this is because of the nature of the church as a sacrament of Christ. And so it's part of our, if you like, our spiritual DNA. We then last week looked at service in scripture and we reflected on four scripture passages, which between them covered a number of aspects of service. And this week we're going to look in a bit more detail at what the church teaches us about social justice and then look at ways in which we can serve within our own community. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Mike Slynn and he can lead us through uh, the teaching, the social teaching of the Catholic Church, which um, Mike, I think uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Tony. Right, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. Is that right? Yep. yep. Good. Okay. Um, and uh, one other thing I need to do, which I'll do in a minute, but let's just crack on. Okay. So Catholic social teaching, I'm going to give you six definitions. Hope you can see those. One is that Catholic social teaching is a branch of moral theology. The next is a guide for decision-making. It's authoritative authoritative church teaching. It offers a structural way of reflecting and discerning. It's the church's best kept secret. And it commenced with Pope Leo XIII. Now, one of those definitions isn't correct. So I'm gonna let you, hopefully this is gonna work. Um, oops, if I can get this to work. Let me just come out, out of uh, screen share for a minute. Um, and try and, uh, ooh.
Um, I'm afraid I, I was hoping to do a poll on this, but it's not actually working. So sorry about that. So I'm just going to then um, ask you all to think, think what is your seconds, which you think is the definition that's not correct. Give you 15 seconds. Can you share your screen so we can see it again, please? Because I can't see it. Yes. Right. Um, Right, I'm really getting a, a bit of a mess here. I'm sorry, failing totally. <laughs> I think we're just trying to keep it simple because it's just not working. I, I can share my screen if that, well, I might be able to. Let me try and do that if you like. Uh, let, if I could just have another go, see if it can work this one. Um, so can you see that now? Yep. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, I think I'm just gonna keep it simple then. So there we are. Right. Um, so I was saying, I've given you six definitions. Have you all chosen one? Okay, right. Well, the correct answer is it's number six is incorrect. I thought so. <laughs> yes. Um, the reason being is that if we look back into scripture, we have lots of references to, to social teaching. Let's start with Psalm 96, that all creation rejoice before the Lord. Isaiah talks of seek, seeking justice um, endlessly throughout that, um, all, all the passages in Isaiah. And then in uh, the new, if you think those are actually uh, Jewish scripture, well, okay, let's look at the New Testament and nobody's going to say that Jesus isn't a Catholic. So here we have some of his sayings that uh, we looked at actually last week. Um, we looked at the uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. We looked at Matthew chapter 25 um, and we looked at the Good Samaritan story in Luke's gospel. And then moving on from there uh, in Acts, the church, people of the church um, were recorded their, their actions and a statement made there was that there was not a needy person among them. And so Peter said, serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. But of course, Pope Leo XIII did actually start modern Catholic social teaching in our times. Um, and uh, all those popes had something to say. And there are at least 16 Vatican documents talking about Catholic social teaching. And I have to give you a whistle stop tour. I'm afraid there isn't time for anything more than that. But we'll st start with Pope Leo XIII. And in 1891, in Rerum Novarum, uh, he broke a trend. Previously, um, papal teaching had been very much about sin um, and personal sin and salvation. And then we have in Rerum Novarum, an encyclical on capital and labor talking about societal sin. And there was a focus on industrial, industrialized countries and particularly the living conditions of workers in towns and cities. But moving on to Pope John the 23rd in Mata et Magistra, stated the need for a balance between excessive intervention of the state against the need for state intervention to curb injustices and, and uh, assist in social, social justice. And it advocated worker participation and ownership. Well, there are some instances in Europe where that happened, but, but not in our own country. Then Pachamet Terres, the rights and responsibilities of, of individuals. Uh, it condemned the arms race with its threat of nuclear war 
and condemned racism and advocated resources to be shared in the common endeavor for its development. And then after that, Pope John the 23rd wrote, um, no, he didn't. We'll move on to the Second Vatican Council. Right, uh, two of the documents from the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, this is the first sentence in that document. The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men of this age, especially the poor in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. And then in Dignatis Humani, we have a call for all to respect human freedom and the demand that the church be allowed to work freely and stated that compulsion must play no part in a person's response to God. Truth is to be sought and taught in a manner proper to the dignity of the human person. Then Pope Paul VI, the sixth, and he most famously stated that the development is the new name for peace and went on to express the dangers to conflict if inequalities grow. Human development isn't just based on economic factors. And he mentioned his concern for global poverty. And then later, Pope Paul VI referred back to that earlier encyclical from Pope Leo XIII about capital and labor, 80 years on, you see 1971 compared with 1891. Christians should be called to action to involve themselves in building a just world by analyzing their own realities and devising responses in the light of the gospel. And he talked, and this really came from the South American Bishops Conference in uh, Medellin three years earlier, um, where structural injustice, the option for the poor and liberation were key elements in that Bishops Conference. And then Pope John Paul II, he wrote a lot about Catholic social teaching, starting with laborum exercens. It was a criticism of both capitalism and Marxism, which of course he knew very well from his, his uh, life in Poland. Both of them seeing the worker as an expendable resource. Work should increase human dignity, said the Pope. And he also mentioned solidarity, which refers to the um, the Polish trade union, the free trade union, which was called Solidarity, um, and its action in 1980 in um, barring themselves within the Gdansk shipyard in the face of the communist state. Then moving on to Solicitudo Rei Socialis, um, this raised the issue of structures of sin and option for the poor. And these both come from ideas come from liberation theology. It condemned the gap between the rich and the poor um, and linked that to the arms trade. And also the Pope expressed his concerns about the increase in the numbers of refugees. Then 100 years after Pope Leo's encyclical, the Pope wrote about the excesses of capitalism, the idolatry of the market, and the insanity of the arms race. And he said, private property is acceptable, but the world's goods have a universal destination. And then his fourth document, Evangelium Vitae. Expressed his anxiety about the development of individualism in the world and the culture of death, where individual freedom is placed before the rights of others to life. And he condemned the death penalty, abortion, and euthanasia. And um, just after that encyclical, our own bishops wrote a document called The Common Good. And um, this uh, was a, a, a document about, we'll talk more about the common good. This was a document that was set out just before the uh, general election of 1996. And then finally, there was uh, a a compendium of all the social doctrine to date published. Moving on into Pope Benedict's the 16th era, we have Caritas in Veritati. And this really reflected the 
global economic banking crisis of 2008. And the key concerns included global poverty and justice, the arms race and the environment brought forward for the first time. Truth is what keeps this love, this charity authentic, the Pope wrote. And again, we had another document from our own bishops um, just before the 2010 general election. And then to Pope Francis, Evangelii Gaudium. This was the joy of the gospel, filling the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Uh, this encyclical was an invitation to all Christians everywhere to renew personal encounter with Jesus. Church evangelizers take on the smell of the sheep and go forth. And uh, through our baptism, the Pope reminded us we are all missionary disciples. And in Odato C, he referenced St. Francis of Assisi, praise be, in his canticle to um, brother, son, and sister Moon. And he raised the issue of uh, the need for an ecological conversion. There was a passionate call for humanity to change direction. Development nations, he said, are morally obligated to challenge the modern myth of unlimited material progress. He said the short termism allows profit to trump, no pun, proper to the dignity of the human person and social maintenance. The common good and the effects on the world's ecosystems. And he talked about the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. And then Fratelli Tutti, the Pope built, talked about building a more just and fraternal world through our ordinary relationships. And he went back and discussed the Good Samaritan story and a stranger on the, on, on the road. And he illustrated what he wanted to talk about here, which was envisaging and engendering an open world of solidarity and fraternity. Migrants, all those fleeing from war, persecution, and natural catastrophes, are to be welcomed, he said, protected, supported, and integrated. He demanded the elimination of human trafficking, and he asked all of us to find a better kind of politics based on solidarity and subsidiarity. More on that in a moment. And just reiterated his view that the church does not restrict itself to the private sphere. So just thinking about some key themes in Catholic social teaching, and I'm just going to touch on six themes. First of all, the dignity of the, of the human person. The, the focal point of Catholic social teaching is the human person made in the image of God. And so having fundamental freedom and dignity, and this is the basis for human rights, he wrote. Recognizing this image in our neighbor, the teaching rejects any policy or any social or political system that reduces people to economic units or passive dependence. In the common good, every individual has a duty to share in promoting the welfare of the community and a right to benefit from that welfare. This applies at every level, local, national and internationally. Public authorities, he said, exist mainly to promote the common good and to ensure that no section of the population is excluded. And solidarity, solidarity acknowledges our interconnectedness and interdependence and our fundamental bond of unity with our fellow human beings. We are called, all called to participate in society. and We have duties and responsibilities to one another. This includes welcoming the stranger and looking after the needs of the poor. Subsidiarity holds that all power and decision making in society should be at the most local level compatible with the common good. We recognize the autonomy of others. We do not just act for the poor, we work with them. And Certainly the, the teaching is that we should be holding both solidarity and subsidiarity together in balance. So balancing the rights of society or the state to intervene for the common good with the rights of the individual to determine their own future. 
And then moving on to universal destination of goods, the teaching is that God intends that the goods of the earth are for all. Private property is a, is a right, but its use and regulation needs to be keep in mind this key principle. And we can refer to St. Thomas Aquinas's quote, we need to distinguish between ownership and the use of property. And then finally, the preferential option for the poor. This option gives us a new perspective. We need to keep in mind how any decision we make might impact on the poor. And it also means that we need to put the poor at the center of our thinking. So before I um, send you off to your discussion groups, or Tony does, um, just to mention, let us dream. Now this is, um, this is the book that the Pope, Pope brought out 20, in 2020. And his basic thesis was to respond to the COVID crisis and ask the question, how do we come out of the crisis better than we went in? How do we change our society to achieve that? And he identified that we need to redesign our economies to give all a dignified existence. And he maintained that those on the edges should become the means of changing society. He also said, we don't possess the truth. The truth possesses us by its beauty and goodness. He identified sin as a rejection of the limits that love requires. And he said, our greatest power is not the respect others have for us, but the service we can offer for others. A, a couple of quotes here from St. Teresa of Calcutta. Faith in action is love. Love in action is service. And then from St. Francis of Assisi himself. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words implying that when we're serving others, we are preaching the gospel. So here's a couple of questions, really echoing Pope Francis's question, how do we come out of the COVID crisis better? How do we ensure we don't move back to where we were before, but move forward? And an allied question, associated question, how can we, what, what can we do to bring about societal change in line with Catholic social teaching? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mike, for that enlightening uh, canter through uh, Catholic social teaching. So we're now going to uh, go into our breakout rooms uh, for uh, just over, well, until uh, 22, is that, Mike, does that give you enough time? Or 25 to? 25 to would be perfect, Tony. Until 25 to nine. Um, so to consider those two questions, um, how do we come out of COVID better? And sorry, well, I haven't quite got a note of the second one, Mike. Can you just remind us of the second question? Um, okay, well, the second question was about how do we uh, redefine our economic systems to achieve the objectives of Catholic social teaching. Yeah, okay. Part of the evening, I think, um, and it's about testimonies. So um, as we did two or three weeks back, Sheila Way kindly stepped in and talked a little bit about uh, what calls her. Okay, um, I guess it all started with the Alpha course for me. Um, and um, I've done, I did a couple of testimonials for that um, at church. I think I, I had a change, I guess, being spirit filled afterwards um, and felt compelled to do something in the community and not just go to go to mass and be um, a passive parishioner um, as I as I felt it was. Um, so, yeah, I did. A, I did um, a considered chaplaincy and um, felt that sort of God put a burden on my heart for the homeless and wanted to help in some way and the obvious starting point was the night shelter so I volunteered there as a cook and then offered to do some work in the um, admin office and then it turns out that the office manager and um, her husband are both committed Christians and when I turned up with my other half um, for the first volunteer session we we were introduced them got talking and they'd been praying for more Christians to join so they felt that was an answer to prayer and that was really nice um, 
but it still feels quite sort of a secular environment. There's no prayer provision for the homeless. Um, so that's something that I'd very much like to see um, change if possible. So please pray for us. And if anybody's interested, I know I shouldn't probably plug it, but please come and join because it's just me from St. Peter's. Um, the role as voluntary cook and uh, office admin person developed into the liaison between St. Peter's and the night shelter, um, which I've done just quite recently. And um, it's something that I feel makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to go and do something for someone else uh, meet the people, the, the residents, um, and sometimes we get a chance to talk with them and get to know them a bit, especially during COVID, we did a bit more cooking and it feels really amazing. And then when, I, when I'm there, I feel like I walk away and I feel like maybe God has smiled on me that day or that evening for, for not thinking about myself and just what I wanna do, but spending three and a half hours cooking and then serving and washing up and and um, being kind to people. And I feel like if he's smiled on me, then that's got to be the very best thing in, you know, in the world. So that's, that's why I do it. Uh, Liz, um, would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, so, so thank you. So Mike said that I was the prayer coordinator for, prayer, for street pastors, which is a role I've only just taken on. And I haven't actually written anything about that because I haven't really done very much in that <laughs> in that yet, um, but what I have been is a is a prayer pastor with a team um, of Winchester Street pastors who go out uh, once a month in the evening. Uh, their their aim is to provide reassurance, safety, and support through caring, listening, and helping people that they meet on the on the streets in the. Uh, in the evening on a well our team goes out on a Saturday night so you could meet anybody from the uh, street people uh people who've like got lost from their friends or they're drunk or they've had an accident and they're waiting for the ambulance or all sorts of all sorts of things but the street pastors are only allowed to go out if they're supported by at least two people praying for the whole during the whole evening and they ring up regularly during the evening and ask us to pray for particular situations um so i I've, I've found this absolutely incredible because you just see prayers being answered and it really feeds your faith so sometimes things happen and there'll be somebody on the team who what isn't normally on the team but they're just there that night and they're just the, exactly the right person you need for something that's happening just that week and the whole thing you just really see see the holy spirit in action and it's it just i just find it feeds my faith so so much um so how did i get involved um a few years ago i went on the called and gifted program in our in our parish and um i felt called to intercessory prayer i didn't really know what that was i didn't know how to how to do anything with it but a little while later, our very own Mike Slynn gave an appeal for street pastors and prayer pastors in church, and I decided to, to volunteer. Um, so yes, it's a real joy responding to it, definitely. Um, but I was also quite interested a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the spiritual works of mercy, um, to see that praying for the living and the dead is, is one of those, because I'm not very good at any of the other works of mercy so it was really nice to find something that is a way of service that I can really um that resonates with me so I kind of feel that by just looking a bit and exploring with the called and gifted program I found something that that really um yeah feeds feeds my faith um and it doesn't it doesn't just do that it's really um sort of brought, brought other opportunities. So I'm now getting to know people in the other churches and um, it's kind of like leading leading other places. So it's it's good, yeah. So I would really recommend just getting out there and do so. I'd just like to say that we do, we do pray for people on the street quite a lot. I'm not sure that we necessarily know that people live in the night shelter, but we're definitely praying for homeless people regularly. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Um, 
And finally, Claire. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. I've written this down because I rattle on and I would rattle on and on about um, my volunteering for the chaplaincy. So here we go. When I was a little girl, I used to help my grandma clean her parish church. She belonged to the Union of Catholic Mothers. She'd raised seven children, the most part by herself, but still found time to do this simple act of service for many years, even before I became her little helper. Maybe for me, this was where the seed was sown. Maybe her example and that of others in my family instilled in me the importance of living my Christian commitment to love my neighbor. It was only when I heard a plea for volunteers by Winchester City Centre Chaplaincy at church one Sunday a couple of years ago that I even realized there was such a ministry. I heard that for over 20 years, Chaplains have been visiting people in our city centre shops, offices and the law courts. They listen, they build friendships and support people where it's needed. Well, it was then that I felt the nudge. Well, was this something that I could do? Do I have what it takes? Should I find out more and just see what happens? So I thought about it and I prayed about it. And the nudge became more of a push and I went for it. Part of my thinking was, if Jesus was here today in Winchester, where might we find him? Uh, maybe at the Trinity Centre, at the night, cent night shelter certainly, with the homeless sleeping in the city centre car parks, all of these, yes, but also ministering among people around the Buttercross, and the community, which are the shops along the high street. So when COVID restrictions allow, my role as a chaplain sees me visiting my patch of shops in the city centre, taking the message of God's love out and about. Sometimes it takes me out of my comfort zone, but it's good to be challenged. It's really a privilege to be a part of the chaplaincy team and um, still I'm on the road for cleaning the church. Grandma, I think, would be proud. Thank you very much indeed. That was really, really good. And uh, I know, uh, Claire, you also do street pastoring as well. <laughs> <laughs> street pastoring is at three o'clock in the morning. City oh, Centre right. chaplaincy is a little bit more of a... a uh, you know, during the day, a little bit more civilised. That's great. Time. And there are lots of things we're going to come to in a minute. So thank you very, very much indeed, Claire. That's that's brilliant. Thank you, Sophie, Anne, and Liz. Um, we'll just uh, share the screen. So I'm now going to spend just a few minutes briefly tying up. Hopefully, there we go tying up um, some of the threads and it, it's started just a few weeks ago now didn't we when we started talking about serving and uh, we've gone through a number of things and maybe here's how it links together and here's a way of how some of the ways and we can perhaps answer Jesus's call for each of us and it's an each of us personal calling here to be mat carriers in his holy name and you'd recognize the, the picture there, which is on the back of our parish prayer postcard. And it's the paralytic crippled man being lowered through the roof by his friends so that he can get close to Jesus to experience Jesus's love and healing. So this is a little bit of a model. I hope it's not too well, it's not too complicated. It's just a little bit about um, how 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 this ministry and it's an outreach ministry for serving in the community. Um, how we are planning to make it work, and it's something Father Mark asked us to have a look at a few months, a good few months ago now. So sort of in the centre is a is a triangle, and. Uh, this sort of the three elements of service, one might say, and and a fire needs heat, it needs oxygen, and it needs fuel to 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 to, to burn. 
And our core here is Jesus's call to us to serve. That's what it's all about. So we need the heat, which is engaging directly uh, or indirectly with those that are needy. There's a fuel which is about supporting those who serve through prayer and almsgiving. So we're touching on one or two of the examples we've seen, heard about this evening in the testimonies. And the oxygen, and this is encouraging people to discern the call to serve. So it's, it's perhaps maybe this is a fuel thing, but it's, it's bringing people in. And throughout the, the course, um, we've, we've spoken about um, across the bottom here, the Gospels. We, we, we covered the Beatitudes, the Good Samaritan, the washing of the feet, the Last Judgment. Uh, that was last week. And today we've covered something about Catholic social teaching. So we have the Gospels and how this has been, perhaps, I suppose, in how, how we can enact the Gospels in current times and how important witnessing about what, what we do and what, what, makes, what makes us answer a call, which we've just heard. And then there's, um, so, so that's the, the model and, and sort of down the side here, of course, serving, I mean, we mustn't forget that for everybody, there's a lot of personal friendships going on and that personal friendship is, is a, a very major and important call. And it's one certainly in the days of COVID that we are personal friendships to our neighbours is, is extremely important. We have a whole list of ministries that we are working with, supporting, trying to support. And that's part of the role. That is the role for the outreach ministry in St. Peter's. But I hadn't. So what I wanted to do just now is talk about shape. Now, there are many ways of looking at this. And this is about really discerning gifts and abilities. And I quite like this one. It's from The Purpose Driven Life. Um, what on earth am I here for? And it's by Rick Warren. You may have read some of his works and it's very clear. It's a good read. Um, so S stands for unwrapping your spiritual gifts. And some of that we're doing today. We have done in, in um, many other ways of doing it, but we've covered some of that, I think, in this Lent formation. Listen to your heart. Now we've heard that a few times this evening from the in the testimonies. Applying your abilities. Well, everybody's got some amazing abilities and uh, there's plenty of ways of applying them as we saw the different types of ministries that we're involved in. And use your personality and what personalities people have. I mean, just amazing. The four, the four of you giving those testimonies just now and the personalities that you come across in our small groups and our bigger groups and our leaders of the groups. It's, it's wonderful. And employing your experiences. We all have experiences and uh, I think we're there. We're called to share them, called to use them. So we have a, a sort of, I suppose, a way of measuring how, how are we going about this? What are we trying to achieve? Well, clearly we are trying to achieve our parish mission, which is to bring more people closer to Jesus for healing in love and hope and joy. Um, but we, first we want to become a parish. To do that, we need to become a parish that embraces everyone. We want to encourage this welcoming attitude to everyone we meet, not only in church, but throughout our daily lives. And this welcome leads us to serving the needs of others particularly the poor, and we had a discussion in our group earlier, who are the poor? Well, the poor are those suffering poverty, illness, loneliness, lacking essential resources, or those seeking spiritual or corporal refuge. And they're all around us. Um, and the second objective is um, serving with others. Um, how we serve can often be undertaken with other Christian communities and quite a lot of the ministries we have there are ecumenical. And we can show our unity of purpose in together spreading love and care to others in Jesus' name. So coming together as individuals into groups is, is just so important in this. And to serve in our community, to serve in St. Peter's, serving in the community, our ministry needs leaders and volunteers and Part of the function of the, of the group now, the outreach ministry, is to offer support for leaders and assistance to volunteers, not only in 
in, in practical ways, but also in helping them to discern what special, what ministry of service suits them best. And finally, we have a target. Um, it's probably four years away, four years yet. We set it a year ago. And that is to encourage parishioners to be involved um, in serving others. And we're, we're looking for a target of 75% of those in our community um, to be involved in the next four years. So, and this isn't just necessarily outreach ministries. This is um, ministries, other ministries that operate in our parish as well. So I'd just like to finish now with a, a prayer. Now this prayer, I call it a prayer for our outreach ministry of service. It's sort of based on our vision and our mission. So if we would, this would be the, a closing prayer for this evening as well. So um, I'll just read it through. Lord Jesus, we pray for your blessings and graces to inspire each and every one of us and to encourage each other to recognize you in the lost, poor and needy and overcome all obstacles in bringing them to your feet. We pray that we will increasingly respond to your call to us to serve as you serve and to love as you love. We dream and pray that every moment in our lives will be led by prayers and actions of love and compassion. Lead us, Lord, so that through dedication to our ministry, we will be able to bring more comfort, hope and joy to those in need than we could possibly imagine. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us, keep us from all evil and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike Slynn. And a really big thank you as well to uh, the four people that gave those very personal testimonies, which were absolutely amazing. Sophie, Anne, Liz and Claire. So thank you ever so much. That was really inspiring. So it, it remains only for me to say um, that next week we will be looking at the beautiful sacrament of forgiveness, of penance and reconciliation uh, with with Roseanne and myself and Father Stephen. So please come back for that and have a wonderful week. Um, uh, if you want to stay on now for a chat, you're very welcome. Otherwise, that's it for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for a nice Thank you. evening conversation.